between uh, philosophy and, and science. Now we can see this in, in the history of these two fields. The, the, the English word science is a very new word and it's, its application in universities and its application in private laboratories and research institutions as to scientists is very new. For most of Western uh, um, academic history, the term natural philosopher was used. Someone who is interested in things like stars and animals and plants and rocks and you know the sorts of things that scientists are interested in today um, were, were called natural philosophers. They were not called scientists. So the idea of philosophy and science being intertwined in the Western tradition was the case for hundreds and hundreds of years. And we'll see as we go through this course of lectures, it was in the 17th, late 16th and 17th century that we see a bifurcation and we see a branching away of what we now call philosophy in one branch and what we now call science um, in, in the other branch. So there are those sorts of um, historical roots, uh, but there are many other, other things um, as well. These questions are a vital concern, I argue, to philosophers and to scientists. What, what is knowledge? When we make a claim to know something, exactly what are we saying? What, what, what does it mean? What's the difference between knowing something and not knowing something? Is it correct to say we either know something or not know, not know something without anything in the middle? Or are there degrees of knowing something? Are we allowed, are we allowed to do that? These concerns are extremely important. Each time a scientist makes a claim in a paper that they hope will be, will be published. And of course, the nature of knowledge, epistemology and ontology, has been at the core of philosophy uh, for a long, long time. Evidence is supposed to have something uh, to do with knowledge. Well, we'll see that that too is a new idea. What we think of now as evidence, when we looking, you know, we ask a scientist, why are you looking in this test tube? Why are you? looking down that microscope, I'm looking for evidence of such and such. This, this too is a new idea, um, a, a, as we'll see. The relationship between the two, of course, uh, nowadays we expect that knowledge will be supported somehow by evidence. What is the relationship between evidence? How much evidence do you need? How closely tied should this evidence be to the knowledge claim? What's the, how do we know whether it's relevant or irrelevant, whatever tie it, it is claimed? That these kinds of things. Theories and facts and truth. It is a fact true? That, that it, it, it might seem a, a crazy thing to say a fact may or may not be true. But we'll see that, at least as argued by some, facts are constructed. Facts are things that we determine to be facts according to the rules by which facts are made. And that's not necessarily the truth. We'll see, for example, that a fact can be supported in a pragmatic way. That it's a fact that this bridge will stand up and not fall down and not kill people. It doesn't mean that the formulae, various calculations and all the forms of logic and all the, all the knowledge claims that have gone into the construction of that bridge are true. Some of them might not be true, which is why engineers, of course, overbuild bridges, don't they? Engineers overly construct, if you like. They build room for error into a bridge. So, you know, 
what, what's, um, what's pragmatically the case, what we know how to do, we know what to do, in, in, in that sense is, is factual material without necessarily being truth. Anyway, the, these are the kinds of things that we'll be discussing over the next 12 weeks. Don't be, you know, puzzled and confused and, you know, with me throwing the questions at you right now. You can see here too, these kinds of questions are not only of concern to scientists when they make knowledge claims and go about gathering their evidence and go about determining whether something is true or perhaps just probable rather than true. And they're not just of concern to epistemologists, ontologists and, and other philosophers concerned with formal logic, you know, for example. They're also true to many people uh, in wider society. We, we, know, we clearly see here that these questions are very important for a legal system. A legal system needs to determine what is evidence and what does not constitute evidence. What the relationship is between a knowledge claim and the evidence. Does a knowledge claim have to have evidence to, to support it? We can see um, the status of a political issue, uh, a political and social and environmental issue like global warming. These questions play an important part. What is the status of the knowledge claim, knowledge claims that are made by climate scientists asserting the fact that there is a long-term change in the globe's climate? And what is the status of the sceptics, of the critics of, of these claims? In, in order to be able to assess the knowledge claims here and, and the status of those knowledge claims, we need to know what constitutes evidence and what the relationship between evidence and a knowledge claim is and all these kinds of things. So, just in the, those you know, few questions there, we, we see there's a myriad of answers. You'll see that there's some really, in, in my opinion, really interesting and important debates that have gone on over the last couple of hundred years um, to try to answer these questions. So, let me just give you um, some idea here of what we'll be discussing. The professor will be discussing uh, ethics, metaphysics, physics and epistemology, the role of philosophy in knowledge, uh, in knowledge construction and mathematics in knowledge construction. Now, the, the order here has changed, uh, Rasika, has it not? Um, so this isn't coming up first, this will be coming up second, is that correct? Um, we will show you later. Okay, we'll see. We'll, we'll see later when we look at the when, when we look at the website. So, beginning beginning today, um, I'll I'll be continuing the remarks that I've made so far, and talking about how we might uh, recognise a knowledge claim. You'll see that there are a number of different ways that that can be a knowledge claim can be asserted to be scientific. It can be asserted to be scientific perhaps through the application of certain methods, methods reliant on empiricism and induction, for example. Or it might be claimed that science is reliant upon a certain professional ethos on things like objectivity, um, hypothesis testing, for, for example. Perhaps there are certain kinds of knowledge, kinds of knowledges, if you like, in the plural, that are scientific and different ways of knowing the world, different forms of knowledge that can be claimed to be, that are not scientific. And so perhaps it's the knowledge rather than in the method or the ethos that makes something scientific. We'll start off with, with method and we'll start off with um, the methods of practice in contemporary Western uh, modern science and how they differ from methods that were applied beforehand. Uh, we'll go through the, some of the, uh, the, the major exemplars of Western modern science, the, the, formative, uh, the formative schools of thought in Western modern science. 
uh, beginning with the logical positivists, or then 